My name is Stephen Shaw. I've been a police officer for 10 years, and Brian David Shaw was my brother. So I went to college at California University of Pennsylvania, where I initially enrolled in the pre-pharmacy program. And when that wasn't, uh, you know, my career choice, my career path in life, uh, law enforcement was definitely my calling, uh, second chance, I guess, or second choice in life. Um, I went to California University of Pennsylvania initially, played hockey there, um, and then I went to Community College of Allegheny County where I received my associate's degree. Brian went to Slippery Rock University where he played football four years and he received his bachelor's in criminal justice from uh, Slippery Rock University. So I do have family in law enforcement. Uh, my uncle is a uniform, was a uniform secret service agent. He's retired now. Um, working mainly in the DC metro area. Um, but that's not why my brother and I both got into law enforcement. Um, we got into law enforcement because uh, we want to help people. That was the biggest thing. I know it's the answer everyone sits there and is like, you know, oh really, uh, you want to help people? No, seriously, um, that was our thing. Uh, we wanted to help people in their time of, of need. Uh, you know, those people are calling on you and Sometimes it, it might be as much as, you know, the, the neighbor's dog wandered into their yard and they're upset because it keeps happening. Or it might be, you know, someone just shot at them, you know, some even more dire circumstances. And we wanted to be those people that uh, were called upon to help those people in those, you know, minuscule to, you know, super stressful and uh, dramatic situations in their life. I went to the Allegheny County Police Training Academy. Uh, it's in Allison Park, Pennsylvania. Uh, in my opinion, uh, for the Western Pennsylvania area is one of the best academies, if not the best academy, uh, for any inspiring officers to go to. My brother followed suit uh, shortly after me. Uh, it was about four, four and a half years or so. Uh, he, he had finished college and whatnot. Uh, and once he did finish schooling, uh, it was the first thing he did. So as a part-time police officer, I was fortunate enough to work in Fraser Township. Uh, very grateful for that opportunity that they provided me. Um, but not only was I fortunate enough to work there, um, I was also fortunate enough to work there with my brother as well. Definitely a unique thing. Uh, not many people can say they've actually done, especially the same shift, let alone the same department. So when he and I worked together, uh, he was really new to the job, less than a year on at that point. Uh, so it was nice for me to be able to take him under my wing um, and show him the do's and don'ts of the profession um, and to definitely just, you know, toe the line, be a straight laced officer, treat everyone fairly. Um, and the one thing that he was great with was children. I, I always told him, I said, you never know when a child could be your best witness and they might only talk to you because, you know, some children are scared of police, unfortunately. But if you maybe stop by and threw a football with them in the street or they were shooting basketball and you stopped and, uh, you know, shot some hoops with them, taking 10 minutes out of your day to, you know, create a relationship that might change someone's life in the future. Brian and I met in the academy and what what got us talking actually is uh, they, they do those exercises where they make you stand up in front of the class and say, you know, where you're from, you know, why you want to be a police officer. And you know, they ask you all the, the bonding questions. And uh, for each new instructor that we would have, they would ask us over and over and over again. And so we were constantly saying over and over again, you know, I'm Garrett Lynn. I, you know, went to Cal U. I played football. And that was usually Brian's response as well. He played uh, football for Slippery Rock. And Slippery Rock was one of our uh, rivals. And so that got us to talking. And he kind of knew some people that I knew. And um, that's kind of how we, we got to know each other, is just talking about uh, playing football and uh, some of the mutual friends that we knew. And so um, during the academy, Brian and I became pretty close. Um, you know, we, we'd play video games together after work. Um, I'm sorry, after the police academy. Uh, and, and we would talk every day because uh, his seat was directly behind mine, and um, I was—I got my first job in Oakdale, actually, 
Uh, and f I would talk to Brian on the phone. He would tell me, yeah, I got a job out in Cheswick in East Deer. And I'd tell him like, yeah, it's, you know, it's slow out here. Like, I really just want to get going. I want to learn more. And he would tell me, oh, you know, I did this in East Deer and I, you know, was making traffic stops out in Cheswick and I was doing this kind of stuff. And I knew those, both of those places were closer to where I was living at the time. And he said, let me get you a job out here. And I said, put a word in for me. I said, I'd, I'd love to come out. Um, and uh, Chief Scott called me and Chief Mancini called me and I got hired in both those places. And uh, Brian was working in both those places at the same time. So we uh, kind of like partners a little bit. He actually trained me for my first week in East Deer. So policing in Pennsylvania is very strange. Um, and they actually, uh, they talked about it on the news a, a few years ago, how we're one of the only places that has part-time policing. And I talked to my friends from out of state, you know, South Carolina and other places. And back when I was part-time, I'd say, oh yeah, I work for this department and this department. And they were just so confused and I'd have to explain it. And uh, so when I got my two part-time jobs with Cheswick and East Deer, um, I was working a lot of hours and so was Brian. And uh, it just becomes one of those things where you're embracing it at that point because you kind of have to. And so I'd be working, uh, you know, 16 hours with eight hours off and then working eight on, eight off. And Brian would be doing the same thing. So we were, we were always together, whether it was I was in Cheswick, you know, relieving him, I was coming in for three to 11 and he would go up to East Deer for 11 to seven or vice versa. and there were even times where I offered, I said, hey, if you go straight to East Deer, I'm supposed to come there anyway. I'll bring the Cheswick car up and we'll just flip uniforms. And part-time policing is, is and was a, a very chaotic time. Uh, I, like I said, I got very close to Brian and we would spend a whole lot of time together. You know, um, on the rare, rare occasion that we'd have a day off, we would usually go and try and do something. Um, so... When we were working, he told me that he had a brother um, who was also a police officer, and uh, the circumstance uh, presented itself for uh, the two of them to work in Fraser together. And I thought that was so funny at first. I said, "Wow, that's going to be that's going to be crazy having both Shaw brothers." And I hadn't met Stefan yet. Um, you know, officially, I think I'd seen him in passing a few times, and uh, he came down to work in Cheswick with me and Brian, and he was working in Frazier with uh, Brian as well. Those are very close in proximity. So uh, I would go and back them up on calls. They would come back me up on calls. And it was really cool to see the two of them, you know, share a uniform. Uh, sometimes, you know, one time, a couple times, uh, you know, Stefan would be in Cheswick uniform and Brian would be in, you know, his Fraser uniform, and I'd be working in East Deer, and I'd end up seeing, I'm seeing both of them, and just uh, it was interesting to see. Brian had about two and a half years on. His start date in New Kensington uh, was July 1st of 2017, I believe, if I can recall correctly. So he only had uh, about four and a half months on the job at the time in, in that full-time position. Yes, Brian was part-time for uh, three different places. Actually, I'm sorry, four different places. Um, and then uh, he was fortunate enough to land a full-time job uh, with the city of New Kensington, and that was his first full-time job. I received a phone call from a close friend of mine who was an officer in a previous department that I had worked at, uh, and he told me that he didn't know who, he didn't even know if it was true, but a New Kensington police officer had either was shot or potentially was shot. They might have been shot at. Um, we didn't have any real details, anything like that. And I said, you know, anything, you know, my brother's working tonight, so anything you have, please let me know. Um, and he said that another officer who's a close friend of mine was substantially closer to the scene and may have some more information. So I called him to see if, you know, hey, just, you know, anything different? And as soon as he answered the phone, I didn't even get a word out. And he just said, I know, bro, I know, because I guess him and Brian had um, exchanged a few text messages or maybe he'd previously spoken. Um, so he knew Brian was uh, working that night. And I obviously called 
Brian's phone texted and for obvious reasons there was no response. Um, I then contacted my parents, my dad specifically, and I told them that uh, they need to prepare themselves for potentially uh, the worst you know, thing that we can experience in this career, and that's, you know, being killed in the line of duty. Um, it's one of the hardest things I've had to do was to call and tell them that, you know, prepare yourselves for this. And, you know, my dad, he's kind of an optimist at times, and that was definitely a time where, you know, he showed some optimism. He said, you know, we don't have any details. Let's let's just, you know, be positive here. You know, it might not even been him. They might have got shot at, like, you know, stressful situation you know we'll just we'll take it one one step at a time here and uh so hung up the phone with my dad and uh i was kind of pacing around at my friend's house and i had received a phone call um from a sergeant that i hadn't spoken to in probably five years and that was the moment that i knew it was brian that was at least shot in the line of duty. I didn't know that it was as severe as it was at the time. Um, I answered the phone uh, and nobody was there. So I hung up the phone and I called that number, you know, my sergeant back, my former sergeant back immediately. Um, and at that time, Brian's chief was on the other end of the phone and, uh, and he told me that uh, Brian had been shot. Then he started to go further into explaining everything and I just my thing was I just told him I said chief you know I'm in, I'm in this profession too like you know don't beat around the bush with me just tell me like uh, you know how bad is he and he said it, does, it doesn't look good I'm a shot I'm a shot I'm a shot Brian, where are you at? I may have volunteered to do it. But I made a phone call that no son should ever have to make to their parents, and that's telling them that my younger brother had been shot in the line of duty, and you know which hospital that they should go to. Um, I remember it's it's really vivid for me. I remember my mom screaming no in the background, and I just told them I said you need to get to the hospital i told them which hospital i said you guys need to get there fast and my dad said do you have any information on how he's doing and i relayed the information that it just yeah, it doesn't look good upon getting there um initially security refused to let me in the back in the emergency room area um and eventually i did get back in there and uh, shortly after my rival, my brother's chief, who I had known prior to, um, showed up. And uh, he said, you know, is there anything I can do for you? And I said, you know, being a man of faith and a man of God, as, as was my brother, and as was my chief, we all went to the same church when my, my brother and I were younger. Um, I said, yeah, can we get down on our knees and say a prayer? And we both did that right then and there um, saying a prayer for God to spare my brother uh, but I understood if he needed him and from there my parents arrived a short time later and we spoke to them and they kind of put us in a little back room but I refused to go in there I, I wanted to be as obviously as close to my brother as I could and uh, so I stood there in the ER and the chief told me that, you know, I'll, I'll, as soon as I find anything out, I'll let you know. Um, and uh, he went over and uh, spoke to some uh, medical staff. I'm not sure if it was, I'm guessing a doctor of some sort or 
whatnot. And at the time, I thought, you know, he was uh, coming over to tell me something good because he had like a little, I don't want to say half smile, but he had a look of positivity on his face. If I only knew that he was mustering up the courage to tell me the thing he didn't want to tell me is that my brother didn't make it. Um, he's a very large man. Uh, put me in a hug and uh, I said, tell me something good, chief. And he whispered in my ear that my brother didn't make it. And uh, Those are the hardest words I've ever had to hear in my entire life. Something I'll never forget is I pulled up to the roundabout in Allegheny Valley Hospital and uh, Mike was driving and I saw Stefan's diesel parked practically in the front door. Um, his front right tire and back right tire were both on the sidewalk and you could tell that he just pulled up, got out and slammed the door and ran inside. And as soon as I walked in the door, I saw Brian's mother, Lisa. And at the moment I, I was still composed because I knew that I had to, I didn't know who I was gonna see in there and I was gonna just do my best to be strong. And as soon as she turned around, I saw her face and we looked at each other and I, I ran over to her and I just melted in her arms. And I just remember telling her how sorry I was and that I couldn't believe it. She sat there and she held me for quite some time. And she, Mike walked in behind me and Lisa told him the same thing. <laughs> and they escorted us back to uh, a private room. And as I was walking down the hallway, I started to see all my friends that I worked with and that I built really good, strong relationships with through you know, working in the area. And some of them were sitting on the ground, some of them were holding each other. And I just remember saying to myself that there's no way this can be real. That, you know, these people that have helped shape my career as a police officer and showed me how to do certain things, and where stuff is, the best way to do it, are all in the same hallway broken. People that I saw as role models, you know, just curled up into a ball on the floor. And then I, when they took us back into the room, Brian's dad, Stefan, and his brother, Stefan, were both in there. And as soon as Stefan saw me, he came over and he grabbed me. And it was uh, another one of those moments that I'll never forget. <laughs> it's something that, you know, you don't have the words to, to give to a brother who just lost his younger brother and walked me back to the cafeteria where everyone was. And that's where I saw more and more and more people coming up. And uh, there was detectives, the entire New Kensington Police Department showed up. Well, what seemed like the entire New Kensington Police Department showed up. And they were all just distraught. And they, everybody kept going up to Lisa and just saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And from there, they escorted us to the back loading bay where the ambulance uh, entrance is. <laughs> and they had us line up and they rolled Brian's gurney from the back door into the ambulance where he was transported to the uh, funeral home.
the next day, Saturday morning, um, I still hadn't gone to sleep. And I remember uh, turning the news on and I saw Brian's face. And it's kind of when it started to become real for me is to see um, the newscasters talking about Brian. Police officer shot and killed on the job tonight. A manhunt now underway for the gunman. Multiple sources have told us that a police officer was shot in the chest around 8.15 or 8.30 this evening. The gunman is still at large. In fact, uh, multiple police agencies are involved. Walking into the lobby of the New Kensington Police Station, on November 18th at 6 a.m. I was met with a very chaotic scene with officers from all over the state volunteering their time. Dispatch in the station gathered everyone around and asked who was familiar with New Kensington and who wasn't. And what they did was they paired those who were and those who, who were not together in a two-man unit car. And subsequently, I was paired with a state trooper. After assisting all day into the night on the first day of the manhunt, I was still required to work my shift at my local agency for night turn. So at 11, I reported to my department, took the unmarked car and called dispatch and said, listen, I just assisted in the manhunt all day. I'm physically and emotionally exhausted. Here's my cell phone number. I'm going to sleep with my phone inside my vest. Call me <laughs> if I get a 911 call and you guys will wake me up and I'll go handle the call. But otherwise, just so you know, where I'm at and what I'm doing, that way I'm accounted for. The manhunt ended up lasting a total of four days, ending on the morning of the 21st when the suspect surrendered to Pittsburgh SWAT. So almost five years later, I'm, I'm running into officers that I didn't know at the time, that I know now, that volunteered their time to assist in the manhunt. And the respect I have for these officers is something that I could never put in words. In the next couple of days, we uh, we met at the funeral home and we practiced what we were to do and folding Brian's flag and all that kind of stuff. And I just remember thinking to myself that this is something I shouldn't have to do. I shouldn't have to learn how to fold this flag the right way and do this whole presentation. I shouldn't be doing any of this. He said, you know, I should be getting ready to go back to work after my couple of days off. And, you know, I should have talked to Brian last night or, you know, we should have gone out and had a beer last night. And instead I was learning how to bury my friend. Waking up the morning of Brian's funeral, the day that we would lay him to rest, to the news that they had a suspect in custody and that that suspect was believed to be the man who killed Brian. And the day we buried Brian was the hardest day of my life. We met at the funeral home and they did a short service there. And I remember having to say goodbye to Brian the last time at the viewing before we would close his casket and take him. And I remember I tucked uh, one of my old name plates from my uniform into the uh, the, the dressing of the casket. Uh, I just wanted to have something go with him of mine. And Shannon and I said goodbye to him. And we escorted him to the cemetery where we folded his flag. And I saw something that day that I'll never forget. I saw an unimaginable number 
of uniformed police officers in that cemetery and at that church and that was the first time that the thin blue line became tangible for me when I saw those people those officers come out and show their support for Brian, people that knew Brian, Brian's family. I knew that the thin blue line was much bigger than, you know, a sticker that all of us have on the back of our truck or, you know, the, the license plate cover you have. It's much more than that. So the hardest part, in my opinion, of the grieving process was the physical funeral itself. Um, I had gone through um, a law enforcement funeral prior to, um, it was actually the very first time that I had ever put in my uniform on in my entire career, uh, it was for a funeral for a local officer who was killed back in, in 2011. Um, saying goodbye for the final time, you know, closing the casket and knowing that, you know, you're never gonna see that person again. And you sit there and you wonder, you know, am I gonna forget their face or their voice or their laugh? Um, and I'm living proof here that it, uh, nearly three years later, uh, you haven't, I haven't forgotten any of that. <laughs> it's all uh, really stuck with me. Um, the grieving process itself is never easy as any loss, you know, you try to prepare, you can try to prepare for it. You know, if a family member has, you know, terminal cancer or, uh, you know, failing kidneys or something along those lines and, you know, the inevitable is going to happen. We all do die. Um, but the sudden, sudden, uh, shock of it being, you know, completely, um, you know, being unprepared completely by it. Um, that's, that's what I would say is also extremely difficult. Um, it's not easy in any way. I can't say, you know, I don't want to say that, you know, a sudden death is, you know, more difficult than, you know, something that people can foresee coming due to illness or something like that. But, uh, that initial shock is is truly brutal. So when I first met Stefan, he was a very different person than than he is now. Not for any other reason other than, you know, when you suffer a trauma like he did, I feel like you know, obviously it's a progression in the recovery process. And for somebody like him, I don't think that you ever fully recover. You just learn to cope. When I first met Stefan, he was very guarded. Um, and you could tell that. I, I could tell that because I couldn't read him, you know, at all. I didn't even know if he liked me. You know, I we have great conversation and he'd always want me to be around. In the beginning, even very, very quickly, he seemed, you know, to need company around. And I was honored to be that person to provide him that. But I wasn't sure if he, his, I think what he felt on the inside wasn't being shown on the outside, but he did. He, he was very, um, I hate to say it this way, but very dark at first, understandably so. Um, and then, you know, he'd have these, I always call it a sine wave of emotion, you know, but he wasn't explicit about it. Everything, Stefan always kept everything on the inside and that's what made figuring him out even more difficult. And, um, he's gotten better with that, with time. You know, I think after he had a couple therapy sessions, um, you know, and learned 
coping mechanisms from this entire situation uh, that he learned that he can talk about things and it might feel a little bit better to talk about things sometimes. But in the beginning, it was a really interesting situation to be in because I couldn't empathize with these people at all. Um, I could sympathize with them. I could try to offer as much condolence as I could, but I wasn't experiencing what they were going through because Brian wasn't a family member of mine. I didn't know him like that. But I think that it was meant to be that way, that a third party like myself who didn't have that emotional connection to that person would be around these people to kind of keep um, the normalcy uh, kind of, I don't know how to explain it, not the normalcy, but to be able to keep them grounded or at least keep Stefan grounded. Um, and I did my best with that. Nowadays, you know, after time has gone by, you know, there's always going to be those situations where, you know, he gets emotional and, you know, obviously with any death, I think anybody can understand, you know, there's going to be smells, there's going to be visual, you know, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, indications, reminders of people and times that you spent with them, but he deals with them so much better now. Um, work being that he was in law enforcement. When I met Stefan, he was back on the job. He had chosen to go back to work, I think a few weeks or a month after Brian was killed. And through the beginning of our relationship, he had slowly kind of progressed, maybe because he had gone back too soon, you know. And I really think that would depend on the person. You know, do they need that, you know, returning to normal type of situation for themselves to be able to get through the trauma that they're going through? Or should they take more time? And Stefan being the person that he is, being as strong-willed as he has obviously wanted to get back. Well, when he went back, it might have been too soon. He ended up having to take a little bit more time off of work because of his um, mental capacity at the time, his the trauma that he had suffered. And once he got through that, and it was, it was tough. I mean, to not be able to sit there and look somebody in the eye and say, I know what you're going through, but try and help them through it. It almost feels like nothing you say is going to matter because, you know, you're not going through it. They are. You can only be there. You can only listen. You don't speak as much as you think that you would speak. You just do everything you can for them. So initially, um, for a short period of time, um, I did think about quitting. Uh, what I was going to do to make you know, the money that I was making, I don't know. Uh, but at the time, it was, you know, I wanted to be there for my family as much as I could. Uh, my mother would probably, I could probably say that if I wasn't still doing this job, she would be more at ease. Um, and happier uh, but in the end she's still very supportive of my decision to continue down this career path uh, my brother was the type to you know bust your stones about stuff joking and uh, you know, it was one of his things he'd always put a smile on your face and I think that if if I wouldn't uh, have continued this career um, he'd have some choice derogatory words to address me with uh, to kind of say, you know, you better still do what you love to do. You know, don't let my death keep you from doing what you love. You know, continue to go out there and do what I was doing. You know, keep impacting po people in a positive fashion. Uh, my brother was in the process of getting a tattoo that went around on his chest. Um, it had a banner on it that said, God has a plan. 
my brother was almost killed in a car accident uh, some two and a half years prior to uh, him being killed in the line of duty. And that was a big thing for him as he initially, you know, said, why me? Why, why did I pull through this? And other people, you know, some sense, so, you know, their, their injuries are way less than mine, but you chose me to stay here. And that's where my brother realized that, you know, he had a plan for it. And that was to follow that path of righteousness and walk down that path of law enforcement as his career and to give back what God had given him, help someone else out. Take the time to speak with the child. Take the time to help the old lady cross the street. Uh, the person who calls every day about the same thing over and over, maybe go a little extra mile for them to, you know, appease them. Or maybe even help them out, solve the issue for them. And Brian took that, he took it to heart. And so, uh, I, I definitely didn't lose any more faith, any faith that night. Uh, it was, if anything, I gained faith because I, I realized that my brother was needed for the higher power. No one wants to look at it that way, you know. Some people show anger, you know, why him? My brother in his 25 years of life impacted a lot of people. And during his funeral, the showing that we got in return, the outcry of support from the community and just the overall support from family, friends, other law enforcement, first responders, firefighters, etc. That, that just showed that my brother had did what he was here to do. He impacted several lives in a positive fashion, and God decided that it was his time. My family decided that we wanted to create a foundation in his honor. Anyone that knows my brother or knew my brother at the time, um, his Facebook and Instagram had pictures of my parents, yellow and black lab, huge dog lover. Um, so we figured that would be the best thing to do, is to raise money to donate a canine to um, a local police department so we figured if we could alleviate the huge initial cost of just the dog and sending the trainer or the dog handler so the canine officer to the um, kennel where they stay for actually six weeks and go through a very very thorough training process um, and then we give four $1,000 scholarships um, to go to Burl High School, where my brother and I graduated from, and to go to Valley High School, which is our rival, essentially, <laughs> we went to Burl, but it's where Brian worked in the city of New Kensington, and that's the high school in the area. So we wanted to give back to both places in his memory. Um, so we do a gun raffle annually. Um, there's also the Brian Shaw Ride, um, it's the Officer Brian Shaw Memorial Scholarship Ride. And it's been, it's occurred for three years now. And they have raised substantial funds. Um, is what it does is it gives a scholarship to a cadet in the police academy. So my brother and I both went to the Allegheny County Police Training Academy. And they graduate two classes a year. And we pay that, sorry, that ride pays for uh, a scholarship from each of those classes. So it's roughly around $5,000 now um, with everything included for the police academy. So um, that's what that entity does. Um, I know they're striving to get a thousand motorcycles and if it wasn't for COVID-19 this year. I, I still, I think we might have, but regardless of COVID-19's impact, um, they, they did amazing very very wonderful turnout this year and hoping next year will be even better and better so moving forward um to today um you know still going through the grieving process it, the fact the, the old saying you know uh, time heals all wounds um, they heal very slowly when it comes to something like this very slowly 
I can say that it's gotten easier. Um, it's obvious that, you know, uh, emotions will still get the best of you when you talk about it. But at the same time, you know, it does become easier over time. Um, I've, I, you know, I seek to, the help and guidance of, you know, therapy and whatnot to help get me through it. And uh, I just did a golf outing recently um, for a foundation called Cops for Cops. Whereas what they do is they raise money for the families of fallen officers. Um, and they have a Pennsylvania branch and um, I participated in that golf outing. Um, and I just found out that they actually have a siblings retreat. Um, it's down in St. Louis, Missouri, and they'll cover your airfare and you get on to St. Louis and essentially it's like a group therapy thing. You know, you get to meet other family members. For me, it would be other siblings, brothers and sisters. Maybe they might be an accountant or they might be in law enforcement too, but it's uh, someone for me to network with and, you know, contacts throughout the United States that, you know, maybe someone I know has, you know, a tragic incident happen to them and, you know, this person might live substantially closer and can maybe meet up with them, take them out to lunch, talk to them, things like that, and, and maybe get them walking down the right path because although everyone, whenever something happens like this, everyone, you know, wants to help you, you don't know which way to go. So I feel that some, if, if me personally, if I would have had somebody to help me out um, and just point me in that direction initially, I think that I could have addressed my personal issues uh, at a faster pace. Um, I still think it came very quickly. Um, you know, seven, eight months after my brother's death, I, I was able to finally seek the help that I needed. Um, and it does help. So I think that would be ideal if, if I could say if I could go back but today I, I feel that I'm doing very well um, you know with the job still have your times of hypervigilance it, it, it never goes away um, it's it's a part of uh, the PTSD that you get from this um, if you have your family member of you know a law enforcement officer who's killed in the line of duty and you do this job too um, I didn't believe in PTSD. Uh, I didn't, I guess you could say I didn't believe in it. I didn't understand it um, and what it actually entailed. And once I was diagnosed with it, that's when I truly uh, learned what it was and how it affects, affected me. And I think it's important to raise that awareness as well because you can still do this job. I'm living proof that you can. It's not easy. It's a, it's a battle that you have to uh, be willing to fight. It could have been really easy just to give up and quit. Uh, but I, I couldn't do that. I had to continue my legacy and also living for my brother. You know, they tell you not to do that, but it's part of my driving force and every person has their own driving force in their life. So I am employed with the Penn Hills Police Department. My first day at work was 6-6-17. So you go in, you start going through all the paperwork stuff, blah, 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 blah. And I go home after my shift. Regular daylight stuff. Well, my brother had applied for the city of New Kensington. And at the time, you know, I'd, I'd known some people, so, you know, you try to get some backdoor information and no one wants to, you know, give anything up. It's all, you know, secret squirrel business. But uh, he called me that night and stated that he was hired by the city of New Kensington at the council meeting. We didn't know his start date or anything yet, but it meant, like, it was really cool to share that experience that, you know, I started my full-time job that I was seeking for some time. And then that same day that I got the gratification, you know, of starting my full-time job, he finds out that he's getting hired in the department that he's wanted to work in. So it, it's a very sentimental memory. I could tell you plenty of outlandish stories and, you know, make you laugh and make you cry. But that, that 
that's truly my favorite memory. That phone call was uh, something that sticks with me today and resonates with inside of me. And part of the reason why I wanted to still do this profession, uh, even after losing my best friend. Thank you.